What is a diode? A diode is a component that comes in various sizes and typically has a black cylindrical body with a stripe at one end, as well as leads for circuit connections. The specific functions of these ends will be explained later in this video. The end with the stripe is called the cathode, while the other end is the anode. There are also other types of diodes, such as the Zener diode or the light emitting diode, LED, but we won't be covering those in this video. You may have used a diode before, but do you truly understand how it works internally? A diode allows current to flow in only one direction within a circuit. In this video, we have animated the electron flow, where electrons move from the negative to the positive. However, you may be more familiar with conventional flow, commonly used in electronics engineering, where electrons flow from the positive to the negative. Electron flow represents the actual occurrence, but you may encounter conventional current explanations as they are easier to understand. Just keep in mind which one we're using in this context. When we connect a diode in a simple LED circuit like the one shown, we observe that the LED only turns on when the diode is installed correctly. This is because the diode allows current to flow in only one direction. Depending on how the diode is installed, it acts as either a conductor or an insulator. For the diode to function as a conductor, the stripe end is connected to the negative side, while the black end is connected to the positive side. This setup allows current to flow and is referred to as the forward bias. If we flip the diode, it acts as an insulator, preventing current flow. This orientation is known as the reverse bias. In this video, we will explore in detail the structure and working principle of the diode, which is the most fundamental circuit element in electronics. Before we delve into the structure of the diode, let's first explore the electron configuration of atoms. Electrons are organized within the electron cloud based on the distance of their orbits from the nucleus. These orbital layers are also known as shells. Each shell has a specific electron capacity, determined by a rule in quantum mechanics. According to this rule, an orbit is filled when the number of electrons it holds is equal to 2 times n squared, where n represents the number of shells away from the nucleus being considered. This value is also referred to as the principal quantum number. To calculate the maximum number of electrons in a shell, we can apply the equation 2 times n squared. For example, the first shell would have 2 times 1 squared, which equals 2 electrons. Moving on to the second shell, we have 2 times 2 squared, resulting in 8 electrons. The third shell would contain 2 times 3 squared, equaling 18 electrons. Similarly, the fourth shell would hold 2 times 4 squared, resulting in 32 electrons. This pattern continues for higher shells. It is important to note that elements can have up to 7 shells, but not every shell may reach its maximum electron capacity. The formula presented here allows for the calculation of the theoretical electron capacity for elements with a maximum of 7 shells. Atoms with 1, 2, or 3 electrons in their outer orbital are conductive while those with four electrons are semiconductors. Under normal circumstances, semiconductors behave as insulators, but they can be made conductive by adding certain additives. Diodes are created by doping these semiconductors with impurities. The most commonly used semiconductors for diodes are silicon and germanium, which have similar crystal structures. Silicon is abundant in nature, while germanium is relatively rare. Due to its abundance, silicon is widely used in semiconductor circuit elements. On the periodic table, silicon and germanium are located in group 4A. Silicon has an atomic number of 14, 
while germanium has an atomic number of 32. This means that silicon has 14 electrons in total, while germanium has 32 electrons. When we examine the atomic structure of silicon, it has two electrons in its first orbital, eight in its second orbital, and four in its outermost orbital. Similarly, germanium has two electrons in its first orbital, eight in its second orbital, 18 in its third orbital, and four in its outermost orbital. Although we represent them in two dimensions, they are actually composed of atoms joined by covalent bonds. The bond structure of silicon is depicted as each atom in the outermost orbital forming covalent bonds with other silicon atoms. Germanium has a similar bond structure because both elements have four electrons in their outermost orbital. When these structures are doped with other atoms, new materials are formed. These newly formed materials are called n-type and p-type materials. Now, let's understand what n-type and p-type materials are. Let's consider the element antimony, sb, which has five electrons in its outermost orbital. Antimony is an insulator due to its five electrons in the outermost orbital. However, when we dope an antimony atom with silicon, four electrons in antimony's outermost orbital form bonds with four silicon atoms, leaving one electron uninvolved. This doping process creates a new structure called n-type material. Similarly, let's consider the element boron, B, which has three electrons in its outermost orbital. Boron is a conductor because it has three electrons in its outermost orbital. When we dope a boron atom with silicon, three electrons in boron's outermost orbital form bonds with three silicon atoms. As a result, one silicon atom remains uninvolved to maintain the bond, creating what is known as p-type material. Whether it's silicon or germanium, the principle remains the same since both elements have four electrons in their outermost orbital. To illustrate this, we can represent the p-type material with hollow circles and the n-type material with circles containing additional electrons. When we combine the p-type and n-type materials, we form a diode, which is the most fundamental circuit element in electronics and provides numerous benefits. The p-type part of the diode is called the anode, while the n-type part is called the cathode. The cathode is distinguished by a white stripe. The circuit symbol for a diode is depicted with a stripe on the cathode part and in the shape of a triangle. Now, let's explore how a diode works. On the left, you can see the internal structure of a diode, and on the right, there is a corresponding figure. Let's connect a voltage source to the diode as shown here. When the diode is connected, electrons from the n-type part flow into the holes in the p-type part. This results in the relocation of electrons from the negative pole of the source to the positive pole. It's important to note that in electronic circuits, the direction of current flow is considered opposite to the flow of electrons. Therefore, in this circuit, the current flows from the positive, plus, to the negative, minus, direction. When the diode is connected in this manner, it allows current to flow through the circuit. However, what happens if we reverse the diode? If we remove the diode from the circuit and connect it in reverse, the electrons in the n-type part will be attracted to the positive pole of the source. Consequently, there will be no electron transition to the holes in the p-type part of the diode. As a result, no current will flow through the circuit since there is no electron transition. In other words, the diode only allows current to flow in one direction within the circuit. To illustrate this, when the diode is connected with the flat side facing forward, the lamp will light up as the current flows through the circuit. However, if we connect the diode in reverse, no current will flow, and the lamp will not light up. Similarly, if we replace the lamp with a motor, when the diode is connected with the flat side facing forward, the motor will start as current flows through the circuit. Conversely, if we connect the diode in reverse, no current will flow, and the motor will not start. It's important to note that the voltage value at which a diode allows current to flow differs depending on the material used. 
For a normal silicon diode, it typically allows current to flow after reaching a voltage of approximately 0.7 volt. On the other hand, a germanium diode allows current to flow after reaching a voltage of around 0.3 volt. However, these values may vary for different diodes, but for theoretical circuit analysis, these values are commonly considered. We can represent the relationship between current and voltage in a diode using a current voltage graph. The current voltage graph for a normal silicon diode shows that it allows current to flow after reaching approximately 0.7 volt and is polarized forward. Likewise, the current voltage graph for a germanium diode shows that it is polarized forward and allows current to flow after reaching approximately 0.3 volt. Now, when a diode is connected in reverse, it's important to determine how much voltage it can withstand without allowing current to flow or causing damage. Similarly, we need to determine the maximum current it can handle. To obtain this information, we refer to the data sheet provided by the manufacturers. For example, let's consider the widely used diodes, such as 1N4001 to 1N4007. The data sheet provides details about their physical and electrical characteristics. For instance, the 1N4001 diode can withstand a maximum reverse voltage of 50 volt without damage while the 1N4007 diode can withstand up to 1000 volt. The maximum current that all these diodes can handle is 1 ampere. In circuits with higher current requirements, it's necessary to choose a diode with appropriate specifications. Now, let's imagine a scenario where our circuit has a current of 2 ampere. If we connect a 1N4001 diode, which can handle a maximum of 1 ampere, it will be damaged. In such cases, if we connect two 1N4001 diodes in parallel, the main current of 2 ampere will divide into two, allowing 1 ampere to flow through each diode. This way, we can use the diodes without causing any damage. Diodes find applications in various areas of electronics. One common use is in bridge-type full-wave rectifier circuits, which are commonly found in power sources and adapters. As mentioned earlier, diodes are employed to control the direction of current flow in a circuit. This feature proves useful in various applications. For instance, diodes are utilized to safeguard our circuitry in cases where the power supply is connected in reverse. By blocking the current, the diode ensures the safety of our components. Another purpose of diodes is the conversion of alternating current, AC, to direct current, DC. AC, characterized by electron movement in both forward and backward directions, generates a sine wave with positive and negative halves. On the other hand, DC allows electron flow in only one direction, resulting in a flat line in the positive region. To achieve AC to DC conversion, we can connect the primary side of a transformer to an AC source and then attach the secondary side to a single diode. The diode permits only one half of the AC wave to pass through while blocking the current in the opposite direction. Consequently, the secondary side of the circuit experiences solely the positive half of the AC cycle, effectively transforming it into a rudimentary DC circuit. Although the current pulsates, we can enhance this process by employing four diodes in a bridge configuration. By using a full-wave rectifier setup, the diodes control the paths through which the AC can flow, selectively blocking or allowing its passage. As demonstrated earlier, the diodes permit the positive half of the sine wave to pass through, while also enabling the inverted negative half to become positive. This configuration significantly reduces the pulsation in the resulting DC supply. However, to further refine the DC output, capacitors can be incorporated to smoothen the ripple and approximate a continuous, uninterrupted DC supply. Another application of diodes is in BJT or bipolar junction transistors. 
These transistors consist of a combination of N-type and P-type materials, similar to diodes. While the diode is formed in the form of PN, BJT transistors consist of a combination of PNP or NPN. Thyristors and triacs also follow a similar structure, consisting of four N-type and P-type materials combined in the form of NPNP. In this lesson, we have explored the structure and working principle of diodes. We have covered their atomic configuration, doping process, N-type and P-type materials, as well as their usage in electronic circuits. I hope you found this information useful and enjoyed the lesson. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in our next video.